Today we're going to talk about non-surgical spinal decompression and uh, I want to look at first at the importance of non-surgical spinal decompression because the uh, facts stand for themselves. There's more money that's spent on the treatment of chronic low back pain than is spent on heart disease or AIDS or cancer for that amount combined. 54 million people in America are disabled annually due to back pain. 70% of the patients who had back surgery, they still complain of back pain. 25% complained of constant pain and 35% were still under treatment for pain. The average cost for back surgery on this slide shows me about $40,000. This was uh, slide, this data came from a few years ago. A study that was done in Oklahoma showed that the average cost in that study, if you factor in those individuals who are disabled by surgery, then the costs are, are augmented. Or if you factor in other treatments that have to follow the surgery, then those, those uh, factors have to be brought in. 37% of the patients undergoing their first back surgery have returned to work. We'll look at this data later with respect to some information from the study done by Arm Back Steve. Only 27% of patients with more than one back surgery return to work. 27% were permanently off work. These are the uh, design, the new design of the Genesis VAXD lumbar treatment. And we have a, a combined equipment for lumbar treatment as well as cervical. We have a combined unit that's used for lumbar treatment as well as for cervical treatment. The operation of both of them, that system, is through a computer attached to the equipment itself. And the, this is an active screen, we'll see more about that later, an active interactive screen demonstrating the actual treatment during treatment. The lumbar treatment can be administered prone or supine. Prone is generally about 20% more effective. There's, uh, the only explanation we have for that probably is that the, when the patient is, is lying prone, then the lordotic curve tends to be in this direction and effects on the lordotic curve are much more effective in a prone position and when that lordotic curve is flattened against the table. Uh, the, in the lumbar treatment, we have different ways of, of uh, securing the upper body. We do not use a chest harness. We use either a uh, underarm post in the supine position or the underarm post can be used in the prone position as well. Or the patient can actually grip the hand grips. Some people prefer to do it that way. Uh, cervical, of course, is treated always supine. This, this is the latest 510K, the FDA certification of Vaxi Genesis Dynamic Logarithmic Spinal Decompression. The system is designed to relieve pressure on structures that may be causing low back pain, sciatic pain, and neck pain. It relieves the pain associated with herniated discs, degenerated disc disease, posterior facet syndrome, and radicular pain. This is achieved by non-surgically through the application of logarithmic distraction tensions applied to the patient according to the vaccine protocol. More about this later as we go through the slides, you'll see the rationale behind that. The indications for um, long for Vax D, in terms of the total spine, cervical and lumbar, are herniated discs at one or more levels. Whether that herniated disc is a subligamentous hernia, normally called a protruding disc, or whether it's an extruded hernia, that is one that's penetrated the longitudinal ligament. Degenerative disc disease is another treatment uh, condition treated and uh, as well as peripheral radiculopathy. Patients that have even have drop foot 
with a motor disease, your motor radiculopathy, that can be treated. And the, and the foot drop will recover. The same as loss of sensation. We're going to see some slides that actually demonstrate that later. Fail back surgery is also commonly treated. The success rate of fail back surgery is a little less than it is with the other conditions, on non-operative conditions. But because of the fact that fail back surgery has already had intervention and there's scar tissue present. Posterior facet syndrome is the common syndrome of people that suffer an acute, suffer an acute attack and have a taxi, can't walk straight, can't stand up. And uh, that condition is treated very readily with vaccine. Internal disc disruption is a very serious condition that's becoming more prevalent or being noticed more prevalently today. And we're going to talk about that in depth later on. Uh, the treatment for that and the treatments for that and the options for that are very serious. This is a large-scale study that was done by a, a, a pair of neurologists in combination with the head of biometrics from the University of Illinois. And it was done on a large number of cases, around 800 cases, and in the hernia-generated lumbar disc. The case study was had enough patients they could be separated and determine to determine the effect, the success rate for each of the separate conditions. You'll see that the extruded hernia, this is all herniated this here, extruded at about over 50% success rate, and the other herniations, whether they were multiple or single, these are probably subligamentous or protruding discs, and the response rate in this study was over 70%. The degenerative disc disease, surprisingly, is responsive at the same level of success. And we'll deal with that in a later slide, the rationale for that. The facet syndrome is, looks here on this slide to be only 68%, which is quite low for facet syndrome, because facet syndrome responds very quickly. The reason this is that low is because those cases that had not more than 10 treatments were removed from the study. The study was only done on patients that had 20 full treatments or 20 average treatments. And so a lot of these uh, said patients respond within 10 treatments and they were removed as part of this case study. Fail back surgery responds at about the same level. This is the Cardinal study that was done demonstrating that verbal action of decompression, VAXD, actually does lower the interdiscal pressure, does lower the pressure of the intervertebral discs. Now, this is, no other piece of equipment has ever been able to copy or duplicate this on their equipment. All equipment quotes this study as the paramount study demonstrating the effectiveness of de spinal decompression. It was published in the Journal of Neurosurgery. It was conducted at the Rio Grande Regional Hospital and uh, by a associate professor of the University of Texas. This is how the pressure in the discs were measured. A cannula was inserted into the lumbar disc and into the nucleus propulsus. The needle was put into the nucleus propulsus and threaded through that cannula a catheter then was threaded into the nucleus. That catheter was then connected by a saline bridge to a transducer. This is a pressure measuring transducer, the same kind that's used in the cath lab, and that was connected to a Hewlett Packard pressure monitor. So that's the, the setup. This is an actual scene of Dr. Ramos, the lead author. He is a neurosurgeon who conducted these, this research and this shows that at, while the pressure changes in the disc were being measured at the same time as the tensions were applied to this patient's pelvis. So the dual recording was made of tension and interdiscal pressure. This is a 
and a summary of the curves that were published in that study showing that the interdiscal pressure, these are positive pressures on this side of the line, that's zero. This is interdiscal pressure. The pressure in normal individual lying prone or supine is around 80, 75, 80 millimeters of mercury. These are in millimeters of mercury. This, this slide shows interdiscal pressure versus the vaccine tension that was applied. Remember, we are measuring both tensions and recording both parallel on the chart recorder. You'll see that the press, not much happens to the pressure in the disc. When, uh, when the pound, these are in pounds tension. That's, that's a number of pounds being applied. 25 pounds, 50 pounds, 75 pounds. So not much happened to the pressure in the disc until it reached a point around here. And that point was somewhere around 40 pounds. At that point, then the pressure either, in this case, when you're on vaccine, the pressure dips into the negative range. These are actual zero or negative pressures, semi-vacuum uh, pressures in the disc. The, the pressures in a living subject are never near zero. The pressure in the living subjects is always above zero. You never, there's no physiological no characteristic, no anatomical position that changes the interdiscal pressure to levels even approaching zero, let alone the negative range. Even when you die, the pressure in your disc is elevated by rigor mortis that tightens the muscles and increases the pressure. So we were demonstrating here that pressures in the negative range can be decreased when you reach around 75 pounds, as low as minus 150 millimeters of mercury. That's a significant sub-vacuum effect. Why does it do that? The vaccine is a special mechanism that's patented, in which it, the controller drives the lower part of the body and the harness and the lower part of the body connected to the tensionometer drives that as a unified motion segment. And as it drives this, the processor drives this, there's biofeedback coming from the tensionometer at all times, at about, sampled at about a thousand times a minute, as well as from the positions that this table is in. That all is fed back through the dual computers, the outside computer that's your see the table on, or connect to the table, and the internal control processor, motion control processor. So it's a total automatic biofeedback loop that drives the system, and we can therefore control it in such a way that it creates negative pressures. Now we're going to look at different pieces of equipment. People get some confusion between equipment that provides decompression and equipment that is distraction equipment. There's a numerous distraction piece of equipment on the market, and there is a difference between them. Uh, that, that I'll explain as we proceed. The difference between them is just about the same as it is between a CT scan and an X-ray table. The CT scan and an X-ray table, they look alike, they walk alike, but they don't quack alike. And so they don't, in other words, the CT scan has a computer processor or computer processors and motion control that changes the output of the x-ray. Both of these pieces of equipment administer ionizing radiation through a body and collect it on a, on a disc or collect it on a film. But the output is different as we know when we look at an x-ray or a CT scan. You cannot produce that image with an x-ray. If you take the processor out of the CT scan, it's an x-ray. So for the same reason, the presence of a computer and a processor, multiple processors in VAX-D, changes the distraction process to a decompression process. When you do not change it, this is what distraction does. Distraction that starts the same in terms of interdiscal pressure versus problems of tension applied. The 
green curve is the curve for distraction. And they parallel each other until they reach a point where the proprioceptor muscle guarding reflex is triggered or not triggered. In the distraction equipment, any movement, this is the protective mechanism, guarding mechanism, any movement that triggers the proprioceptors, either the pressure remains the same or actually can elevate. So distraction that does this is actually contraindicated in a herniated disc. To increase the endodiscal pressure would be contraindicated. And that's why traction and distraction fell into disrepute over the years as it was used to treat patients with low back pain and radiculopathy. The blocking or avoiding this proprioceptor reflex is the key to the success of decompression, it is the key to achieving negative pressures during the tension, when the tensions are applied. There is a threshold and in our studies that appeared to be somewhere around the application of 40 pounds and, and to the individuals. This is probably the, part of the difference you can see visually that a distraction device applies a force that is the tension against uh, time here and that's in a linear, what we call a linear track. I mean that, that there's no, this just applies the tension as if you were pulling it with a cable and a pulley. And in fact, distraction pieces of equipment are composed of pulleys and, and uh, winches and, and pulleys. And uh, you see that the distraction not, is not the compression. The appropriate separates recruit back the trunk muscles to assume the guarding role. Uh, the other difference is about the chest harness, which we are not used in VAXD, but are used in the, these pieces of equipment. And uh, that's not really a favorite way of fixing the upper body. Well, on the other hand, VAXD applies the decompression according to what the FDA has, has uh, certified according to a logarithmic curve. That means as the tension, this is, this is uh, the percent maximum tension on this, on this side, and this is time here. As the tension is increased, the time is gradually slowed. So with the more tension, the slower the time is. That actually is a logarithmic curve. This, this process is also repeated even on the retraction phase. A logarithmic thing, curve is applied, a logarithmic slope to the retraction phase in order that you do not trigger the proprioceptors on the reverse of distraction. This is the logarithmic formula of that particular, that, that formula is patented by VAXD. This shows an actual tracing on the screen. You saw that computer and laptop computer with screen. This is the actual tracing that you observe during a treatment. When you administer a treatment on VAXD, it's administered for 60 seconds decompression, 30 seconds retraction, 60 seconds rest period. The tensions applied are 22 pounds pre-tension, 60 pounds tension, and for 15 cycles in a, in a normal session. When you turn the equipment on and start it, then the first thing that happens is the tension, this is tension in this direction, and this is time in this direction. First thing that happens is it, be, it ramps up until it achieves the pre-tension level. The pretension level, in this case set of 22 pounds, is retained throughout the whole session. They not, it's, the system never lets the tension drop below that pretension because any drop below that tends to trigger the proprioceptors. When you turn the treatment start on, this is an actual treatment phase. You would see this in a real-time curve 
as the treatment was being administered. And you can see that the treatment you observe being administered to the patient is an actual logarithmic curve. And that's repeated, that's repeated 15 times in a normal course of a treatment. Does this make sense? Well, it wasn't developed this way. It was found happenstance that a logarithmic curve, in fact, does decompress this by actual research on human subjects, as we showed you, by measuring the tension in the in the uh, disc, the intervertebral disc. But it actually is based on theory. This is Fechner's law of biological response. All senses, the sense of sight sense of hearing, the sense of touch, all of the senses follow a logarithm, this, this Fechner's law, meaning the logarithm, if this is the stimulus, this is time, and the magnitude of the sensation, magnitude of the sensation is proportional to the logarithm of the stimulus. So the, it is a logarithm, this is the logarithm of the stimulus being applied and you get this type of curve with the uh, um, Fechner's biological law. Vaxti actually imply, imply, employs the inverse of this. Rather than the stimulus, in this case being the, stim, the tension, so it's, rather than applying this, the law, we actually reverse this, we apply the time on the logarithmic scale. The tension is applied according to a logarithmic time scale. What happens when you do that? Well, this shows uh, some summary of a number of studies. Many of these studies were done by a variety of <coughs> individuals studying interdisc pressures. So this is a summary of that. Uh, Alf Nackerson was one of the leading uh, researchers in this field, and he was showing that Interdiscal pressures normally in a standing position are about 100 millimeters of mercury. My interdiscal pressure this time will be around 100 millimeters of mercury. As you sit down, actually that increases when you sit down for some reason and flex your spine. But if you are lying down and you flex your knees, you can raise the interdiscal pressure to 140. Or if you apply traction, as I showed you, traction can trigger the muscle guarding reflex and can actually increase the pressure to that 130 or higher. When you're in bed rest, bed rest in any position, supine or prone, your, your interdiscal pressure does fall. It falls generally to a level below the diastolic blood pressure. That is the pressure in the arterioles in the vertebral body adjacent to the disc. And so when, you, when you're at bed rest, there is a time when the interdiscal pressure is lower than your blood pressure. And at that time, then you get oxygen and the disc becomes oxygenated. In these positions, two-thirds of the day, your disc is anaerobic. In other words, the pressure in the disc exceeds the pressure in the circulating system. <clears throat> when the patient is on vax T, you can see that the Interdiscal pressure can be dropped to minus 150 millimeters working. That's a considerable difference. What does that do? What does dropping the interdiscal pressure do? Well, one thing we'll demonstrate for you is actual research that shows that a herniated nucleus propulsus is, tends to be retracted back when this system in here becomes a negative pressure. When this is at a positive pressure, it tends to push this herniated segment out like toothpaste. As the pressure increases in here with various motions, then this tends to push the extruded portions out of the center of the disc. When you lower the unidiscal pressure, the nucleus tends to be retracted by this semi-vacuum effect. And at the same, you know, if you retract that disc, that, proteoglycan material back through the fissure that's in the disc in the annulus fibrosis, you retract it in beyond that, then that can close and 
start to heal. Uh, you would say, well, if that happens during the decompression, why doesn't this just pop out after uh, when the rest fades? Well, for one reason, as you have told you before, we maintain the pretension at a level of about 22 pounds. We found that that prevents this rebound effect uh, from, from dropping back out, and it tends to stay in, the, re the retracted disc tends to stay in place while this closes, but it takes a while to have that heal. That's why VAXD treatments are repetitive every day for a period of some average 20 sessions. Now, I'm talking about the closure of the annular fissure. Well, the annular fissure is the annulus fibrosis that surround, that of the disc that surrounds the nucleus pulposus, the annulus fibrosis. We'll see that the structure of that shown here, is layered. The annulus fibrosis is actually in multiple layers. And those layers are layered at a 30 degree angle. And the measurements will be done in autopsies and so on, in anatomy. And as you distract this vertebral body, that tends to close that angle. So that tends to close the fissure. There will be a fissure or a hole through there that tends to be closed by distraction or decompression. So it, it, it has two things. This is an actual uh, review of an MRI on a patient that had a large left posterior, large extruded disc compressing the fecal sac. This is the vertebral body, as we know, and this is the spinal cord or, or the cauda quina. These are the facets in the spinous process. This is a large hernia, extruded hernia, that's pressing against this spinal cord, the fecal sac. Uh, that's before vaccine. The patient then had vaccine treatments uh, after this date, and the, the next post-treatment post, uh, MRI was taken at the same level. You'll see that the herniation is majority of the herniation has been retracted. Now, this is an actual quote from the radiologist that read this pre and post, this pre and post MRI. He said it was the most dramatic reduction in the ex an extruded segment that he has seen. Uh, extruded segments do not retract spontaneously. This is another view of the patient. And this view is shown because it demonstrates this extruded hernia. This is the nerve root. These are the vertebral body again. That's a nerve root. And this is the nerve root that's being distracted or being compressed by the extruded segment, being compressed out of position. So that means, on, this is on the left side, so that patient will have left radicular symptoms, or right, left radicular um, nerve root impaction. So the left posterior extruded disc is compressing the right jaw displacing the left nerve root. After VAXD, the extruded disc was retracted and the left nerve root was decompressed. So in addition to decompressing the disc, uh, the decompression actually is the same term used when they surgically decompress, that is, removes the pressure on the nerves. This shows uh, the outcomes that were studied on over 300 patients, a prospective case study. This was conducted in, uh, in Pennsylvania. The authors of this are three professors from three universities of physical therapy that had conducted this study. It was sponsored by the Blue Cross study on the effects of VAXD on patients who had undergone previous treatments, uh, two, at least two other treatments, and failed to respond to three other non-invasive treatments. And the 300 patients have then uh, had a series of 20 treatments, and the success of that is shown in this slide. This is before VAXD, the pain level, the VAS scale, the visual analog scale of pain, 
was 5.8 out of 10. And after XD, the treatment fell to 3.7. That decrease is significantly reduced. Now that level still doesn't seem very low. Well, it happens to be artificially elevated because in this study, patients that achieved zero, in other words, patients that achieved remission before the 20 treatments were excluded from the end result analysis. So if those, and they were actually counted as negative. So if those were included in this, this would have been down to levels we saw, the same levels we saw in other studies and we've seen in other studies. The importance of this study, however, is to show that the longevity, this the pain level was measured at 30, at, after VAXD at 30 days and then 180 days. And this shows that it was sustained, the remission rate, remission level, pain, remission of pain, was the same at six months as it had been, or even in, down a little lower, six months later. Now, another study, this was a four-year-old follow-up study. It was not a prospective randomized study as the other one was, but this study was to patients who had achieved remission and saw what the effects of that remission was sometime later. They found that before VAXD, on the vast scale again, the pain level of this group was 7.4. After VAXD, the pain level of this group had dropped. I haven't got that measurement here, but they did measure, they took this group and said, was that success rate retained with, that, with this population? You find that four years later, the pain in that group had actually decreased further. So further improvement occurred, and this, of course, is probably due to healing of that fissures and retention of that. That was statistically significant highly so at a P rate of less than 0 0.001. This is a remarkable slide because these individuals all were uh, prior to the study where there was 70 percent, 70 percent this group here were off work. They were unable to work because of their low back pain. Uh, and we all know that anyone that's been off work for six months with low back pain very, remember the first slide where it showed that only 27% of those people returned to work? Well, here we find that four years later, that same group, 70, it was reversed. 70% of that group were now fully employed. 30% were retired at that point in time. So that's a, a, a very significant longitudinal study. <clears throat> this is an interesting study that was a, actually a prospective randomized control study with a control. In this case, VAXD was tested against TENS as the control. TENS was used in this case because TENS is a treatment that's generally recognized as a treatment for uh, back pain. That was conducted according to a, a uh, protocol established by the Sydney University in Australia and was conducted by these researchers here. Yeah. Um, it was published in the Journal of Neurological Research, started seven, and the study showed the following. Uh, the pain, um, the study showed the following. On VAXD, the pain was decreased by 69%, again around the 70% that we saw on the large 800 case study, 70% of the pain was 70% of the population had their pain decreased significantly, and the the uh, assistance for daily living that had improved by about 34%. What happened to the control group? Well, the control group showed just the opposite. Now this was kind of a surprising outcome, but remember that patients in this study were required to come to the clinic every day, they lay on a table and they either received TENS or they received VAXD on a VAXD table. And they were randomized, 
when they came into the study, they were randomized and assigned to one of the other groups randomly. Well, the pain actually increased in the group who were receiving tens because I guess traveling back and forth to the clinic every day was not a positive thing for someone with low back pain to do. So that is a, is a negative finding that was occurred in the system. They living actually increased as well. <coughs> this um, is an interesting study because it uh, tends to establish the reason why uh, the average or some rationale behind the average of 20 treatments. When we say the average of 20 treatments, that really is a single uh, protruding disc average of number of treatments to achieve remission is around 20 sessions administered uh, usually sequentially, but uh, some clinics administer sequentially for one week and then three times a week and they're on. But on the average, the total number of sessions that the patient receives is around 20 treatments. This shows that this study was done in which one group of patients, 190 patients on this study, and 10 of the, one group of patients received only 10 daily sessions, and the other group received the 20 daily sessions. There was a success rate in the 10 day session, it was a success rate of about 43%, but the negative the negative rate in that group was somewhat was not significantly different than this. And if you class these two together as, as not, a, not an achievement, then then the success rate did not uh, did not significantly higher than that. <coughs> uh, the, but the difference was when the individual went from ten sessions, the group that had twenty sessions, we now see again back to higher than 70% success rate in terms of gaining remission. A significant point here is the negative group dropped the way down from 33% negative to 5. And so this is the kind of study that reinforces why 20 daily sessions is the general average. Um, it also shows an interesting thing scientifically, and that is that VAXD follows a dose-response relationship like a lot of drugs do, that the higher dose, the, there is an optimum dose, and the optimum dose is somewhere around 20 sessions, sequential sessions. For patients that have multiple lesions, patients that have extruded hernias, or compound, hernia, compound lesions, then they, they, those patients may require more than 20, of course, and so 20 is an average. When I mean average, it's an average that you should achieve, achieve a level of success in 20 treatments, but some will require more than that. And so it is an average with a longer tail to the top end. This is disc decompression versus neuro decompression, or plus neuro decompression. So the, not only is the disc decompressed, the word decompression in medicine implies relief of neurocompression as well. And so this study was done to see whether the general term of decompression, that is relief of neurocompression, could be applied to vaccine as well. In this study, <coughs> this, this was this, the current perception threshold technique in which the, the uh, stimulus is provided to the peripheral nerve. Generally, in this case, these patients all had some peripheral sensory loss, uh, generally deep down as far as the foot. They were all tested for their level of sensation, and it was found that that there was a significant difference with vaccine and after vaccine than it was before vaccine. This is this is the level of neurometer grade. That's a sign of loss of sensory or sensory loss. The level of this. And this is a sign that when you get down to low three, that you have uh, not a loss of, of uh, sensory conduction. Well, that's a subjective test. People can, uh, at least criticize this test because it was sub subject to people's perception of whether they felt the stimulus or not. And so another test was set, set up <coughs> using. Dermatomal somatosensory evoked potential. 
a DSSEP study. This study, the DSSEP, the Dermatomas Somatic Sensory Growth Potential, is a objective test. There's no sensory perception by the patient that's recorded in this test. What is recorded is the stimulus is applied to the peripheral nerve. In this case, L5 on the, on the medial aspect of the foot and S1 nerve on the lateral aspect of the foot. The stimulus is applied and the conduction, the rate of conduction of that stimulus to the scalp, to the brain, is recorded with electrodes on the scalp. DSSCP is a technique used in surgery to demonstrate surgical decompression of a nerve. This was published in the Journal of Surgery and it was conducted by a, a uh, neurological group. This is the results. 61% of the patients showed an improvement in their nerve conduction by an objective test. 29% remained the same, and 10% actually did not show improvement. And so this is a significant indication of the relief of neural compression. We're going to now talk about, I remember, I referred to this in the early slide when we were talking about indications, and that is internal disc disruption. Internal disc disruption, or IDD for short, is a serious condition that generally follows trauma, but it's a condition in which the enzymes present in the nucleus of the disc become active, become overactive, and they tend, they, the proteolytic enzymes, they're called metalloproteinase enzymes. Metalloproteinase enzymes, principally stromolysin is, uh, is the major actor here, and that starts to destroy the proteins of the disc. The enzymes, if they get out of control, they're normally under control by our normal process of opto optosis, of, of cell death and recovery. They're normally controlled by, uh, by natural inhibitors in the disc. But if they get out of control due to a traumatic event or something that disrupts the biochemistry of the disc, then the metalloproteinase and these enzymes can begin to destroy the disc. Uh, when they do that, the disc is gradually actually act, sort of just in a kind of a discogenic necrotic process. What's the, what's the treatment for this? The current treatment of the medication will leave pain, into disc injection of substances that block the metalloproteinases. Principally, um, these, this type of material is also we use Enbro for that purpose. Selective endoscopic discectomy, RFA, and that really is just uh, just uh, neutralizing or uh, uh, um, ablating the nerve, so you do not feel the pain. Electrical this, this, this is IDET, interdiscal electrothermal therapy, where the disc is actually heated, and the reason for that is to, to kill the enzymes or inner body fusion or artificial disc replacement or VAX-D. VAX-D is the only non surgical treatment that addresses the underlying pathology. And uh, this was uh, studied in Texas in the study. And this is what it looks like when you have IDD. This is a axial view, MRI, We're using contrast. The contrast shows, and the discogram shows a dye injected into the nucleus, penetrates the outer annulus fibrosis, meaning the annulus fibrosis in this, in this case actually was necrotic. So it was disrupted, the internal disc disruption. On a sagittal view, this is the classic uh, signs. And a, on a sagittal view, the classic signs show that whereas a normal disc in a T2 weighted image, the T2 weighted image is where 
fluids show up white. In a tetraweight end image, the normal disc has a white nucleus that indicates that the proteoglycans, which are the which are the water retaining substance in the middle of the disc, of course. It shows in this slide that an IDD has lost that retention of fluid. And this is then called a loss of signal intensity on an MRI reading. You'll notice that the loss of signal intensity, however, has not resulted in a loss of this height. That, that loss of signal intensity, retention of this height, and the presence of a high intensity zone called HIV is pathognomonic of IDD. Papers published on this by Bada and Charles Apel. Uh, describing this condition. We're seeing more and more of this in, in uh, the population today. This is an actual case of an interventional radiologist, RJ, who developed um, over a number of years, developed IDT. In 2004, he had an MRI taken and you'll see that here the disc, the other disc look fairly normal. And this disc at L5-1 has got loss of signal intensity, has a suspicious looking HIZ, and the disc height is about normal for L5-S1. Uh, he had gone through many various treatments, a variety of treatments, and of course as an interventional radiologist, he wears a 20 pound lead apron every day, and that doesn't, wasn't doing this particular lesion any good as well. But finally, he purchased for himself VAXD to treat this condition. Uh, he treated it following the VAXD protocol, which we're going to discuss after seeing the results of his treatment. This shows that the L5 IDD disc that's really now showing rehydration. This is a remarkable finding. RJ had that study done in 2010. This is following 30 treatments on VAXD and, of course, accompanied by the pharmacological agents that we administer to, uh, as metalloproteinase inhibitors along with VAXD. Let me talk about that. What we're taking advantage of in this case is the diffusion gradient created by VAXD and we want to take advantage of that diffusion gradient at the time when the serum level is at its peak from ingestion of orally taken metalloproteinase inhibitors. Uh, this is, uh, shows you why, what we expect to have happen when you distract the disc, when you increase the interdisco, the, uh, the exchange from the end plate across the, the end plate in the disc then it produces decompressed, creates a favorable diffusion gradient. In this case, we're using that diffusion gradient to transfer certain drugs that are taken. That methylprednisolone is a anti, is a powerful anti-inflammatory and steroid, as you know. That's taken two to three hours. Only one dose, 48 milligrams, one dose taken two to three hours before VAXD. Why two to three hours? Because passing, when an oral dose passing through the stomach, the um, circulatory, the circulation level of the, of the drug reaches the peak around two hours. And so that's continued for one dose each day for one week, and then the second week is tapered off every third week. So there's only a total of eight doses at this very low dose given. Then, at that time, we start a matrix metalloprotein is inhibitor called doxycycline. Doxycycline here is not used as an antibiotic when tetracyclines are used. It's used here because it is approved by the FDA as a metalloprotein is inhibitor. It's taken orally at the same time, two to three hours before each vaccine session, every day for the rest of the sessions. If the patient's on 20 sessions, then it would start in the second week on the Tuesday and Thursday and continue on every day from then on daily to the end of the treatment. This treatment 
is miraculous in IDD. Without this, just the oxygenation of VAXD does raise some level of success with IDD, but this changed the whole picture of the um, success rate in the treatment of this very serious condition. As you saw before, the, the alternatives to that are serious surgical interventions. Let's, and let's talk about this because in the contraindications, uh, at one time we had IDD in here, but no, it's no longer a contraindication because now we can treat that condition. So the contraindications are obvious in most cases, fracture, neoplasm, of course, unstable spinal diseases, which I want to deal with a little bit, uh, describe what that really means. Cotoquine syndrome, of course, is an indication for surgery, ankylosing spondylitis, or any severe systemic disease affecting the spine is uh, taken as a, a contraindication. Severe osteoporosis, what do we mean by that? Actually, we should take out the word severe, because osteoporosis itself is deemed to be a contraindication. Osteoporosis is usually deemed to be present in a case in which they're and their DEXA test, their, their bone density test, shows a T-ratio of less than 2.5. So minus 2.5 on a T-ratio is deemed osteoporosis. Anything between normal, with above zero, and 2.5, it would call, be called, in the negative range, it would be called osteopenia. They can be treated, but they also have to be taken as a precaution and, and uh, Treatments should not be too aggressive with somebody that's close to the minus 2.5. Of course, a rotator cuff tear is only is only a precaution, not a contraindication. Rotator cuff tear means, in that case, the patient probably is not comfortable holding the hand grips, but is comfortable with underarm posts uh, to uh, secure the upper body. Of course, arthrodesis or Fusion with instrumentation is a contraindication. I, I, the problem with that is that once you've had fusion with instrumentation with plates and, and screws, then the stresses are applied to the next adjacent vertebral integral disc, and those patients do suffer. But the presence of this usually the rule them out as a candidate because of because this condition is in itself not, a, not always very stable. This is a spinal thesis. This is a grade two spinal thesis, which is a posterior spinal thesis or retro thesis. Uh, there's also other pathological conditions going on here, but we're just going to talk about spinal thesis. In this case, it's a grade two. If, if it's higher than grade two, then one has to question or, or any spinal disease, you have to question whether that segment is unstable. And uh, the, the determination of that, there's various methods of doing that. You can do x-rays in flexion and look for the Scotty dog collar effect, or the best way to determine this, and the ultimate way to determine that, is to put these patients on the machine and expose them to about five cycles at 50 pounds tension and then have them get off the machine and sit up. If they don't go into spasm, it's not unstable enough for treatment. Now what, what is the reason for that? Well, it, it all depends on their pars. If they have a bilateral pars defect or spondylolysis, bilateral spondylolysis, then the segment may be unstable in many cases is. So in this case, this shows that this patient with a grade two spinal diseases had a right pars defect. However, the left pars was still intact. It looked too intact, but it's still intact enough to stabilize the segment. And this patient can be treated. But I think in the cases of this, and because we have the biofeedback with genesis and absolute control, you, you would not want to exceed uh, 60 pounds tension. When you, if you go over 65 pounds or, uh, in that range, you will then tend to open up 
the, the side, the unilateral side, or defect. And uh, any motion then could put the patient spasm. Um, many of these patients uh, that, if they have a bilateral pause, can you still treat it if you put a pelvic support harness belt underneath the harness to stabilize that segment. Uh, they don't go into spasm during the treatment because they're being decompressed. But as soon as they try to get off the table, sit up and stand up, motion of the uh, segment creates the proprioceptive response in the muscle guardian. Well, this just shows that uh, this verbal uh, action decompression is not the first invention that I worked on uh, back in 1955. I worked on uh, transthoracic decompression or defibrillation, transthoracic cardiac defibrillation. And this was one of the early, probably the first recording of an EKG taken on, and these were, these were, charts were done on animals. This is an EKG taken on an animal that was stimulated to go into fibrillation. This is ventricular fibrillation. And the shock here converted that into multiple ectopic tachycardia that spontaneously then became back to a sinus rhythm. That was published in a book that I published in 1955. Um, this is just a summary of some of the studies that I've been quoting. Uh, we talked about the, the one carried out by the professor of physical therapy, etc. and so on. And there's, uh, all of these are listed on our website. And you can look up the actual, or refer to the actual uh, text of the article in there.